We're all set to tell you about many different uses of the word set, so that you can set your mind to using it in many different situations. So, set yourself down in a nice, comfortable chair and learn about set in this episode of Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. Hello, and if you're a new listener, welcome to the podcast. And also welcome if you've listened to us before. My name's Craig. And my name is Reza. And with nearly 50 years of teaching English between us, Reza and I are going to help you improve your English and take it up to the next level. How are you, Reza? I'm feeling good, Craig. I'm all set for this podcast. And you? I will be in a second. Just let me set this glass of water down on the desk and I'm ready to go. Before we look at different ways of using set, we've got some voice messages from listeners of the podcast. First, it's Carlos from Ecuador. Hello, Craig. It's Carlos from Ecuador, South America. I want to practice my English. So it is a, a proof that uh, how is the preparation uh, with this uh, podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that I don't have a very nice English because that I want to practice. Thank you very much, Carlos, for sending in your message. And your English was clear. We did understand what you said, except there was one piece of your message that wasn't clear to me. It was something about proof, Reza. Did you understand that? I didn't quite catch what you were trying to say. One thing I do know that you can improve, you said our proof. And that is certainly wrong because the word proof in English is uncountable. You cannot say our proof. You cannot count it. You cannot say one proof, two proofs. No. So definitely no ah with proof. So maybe what you were trying to say, Carlos, and I'm not too sure, is that perhaps the podcast is proof that you are improving or something similar. And also at the end, you said because that. Usually because has a preposition of, because of something. So don't forget that preposition. Because of that, I'm sending a message. Because of this, I'm sending the message to you. Another little thing you said, which I almost didn't notice because I've got so used to hearing it. It's become normal for me to hear it, but it is a mistake. You said something about a very nice English. No, ah, same as proof. Very nice English. You cannot say, ah, uh, plus a language, a uh, good English, a uh, good... You can't say that. You have to just say good English, nice Spanish, lovely French, but you cannot say ah. The language that you have is uncountable. We're very pleased that you're listening to us, Carlos. We hope we're helping you with your English and you're doing the right thing. You're practicing. You sent us a message and we're looking forward to hearing from you again in the future, Carlos, with another message in English. Thanks, Carlos. Next, we have a voice message from Dennis from Honduras. Hello, friends. This is Denny Guzman from Honduras. I want to tell you that I have been listening to your podcast since the pandemic began, and I found them very interesting. And I want to apologize that I had not sent you any voice message because I was afraid of not speaking well. And I want to thank you for the great work you are doing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dennis, for your message. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to make this podcast. And we are glad that during the pandemic, you've been able to improve your English and take your mind off things. And hopefully you get a lot of enjoyment from the podcast. Yeah, and your message was very clear. We understood what you said, and I couldn't hear any mistakes. Nothing to improve, Dennis. Your pronunciation is very good. I know Honduras 
people tend to speak a good level of English there because of its history and its proximity to the US. And you're a great example of that. Your English is very, very good. So don't be afraid to send us more messages because we, we love to hear from you again with another message. Next, we have a message from Marcela from Argentina. Hi, Craig. Hi, Rosa and Marcela from Argentina. I know how important pets are in the life of many people. I had a little dog for 15 years. He passed away three years ago and it was really, really painful. He was part of my family. My children grew up with him. Actually, his name, Harry, was chosen because Harry Potter's books were their favorite. He was a loving, cute, adorable, loyal and restless uh, Yorkshire. He will always be in my heart. My dad has a dog and a parrot. He speaks a lot, uh, say his name, Papo, my father's name, asks for food, calls out, come here, when the dog comes out to bark, or he barks too. Besides, whistles, cackles, coughs, sneezes, curses, laughs, and much more. Because all of that, I would like to get to know Coco. If Resta want to share Coco's adventure with us, I think he and our pets deserve an episode. If you haven't done it yet, have you? Bye, guys. Thank you very much, Marcella, for sending in your voice message. It's a pleasure to hear it. Reza, any comments? Thank you very much, Marcella. Thank you for your interest in Coco. And I'm very sorry to hear about Harry, the Yorkshire Terrier. He sounds like he was a lovely little dog. Coco in podcasts, well, actually, the bark of Coco has appeared a few times, hasn't it, Craig? Coco's bark. Yeah, and um, he's becoming more fluent. He's barking more fluently. He's pronouncing his bark very well. And I'm very impressed with the range of his barking that seems to be improving as well. So he's, yeah, he's, he's doing fine. Shall we do a podcast around Coco and his habits? We could, although let me let me tell you, Marcella, actually... He has appeared often in in podcasts in a way because I've recorded podcasts in my house, sometimes remotely with Craig. He's been in his house and Coco tends to be in the room with me. So if you've ever heard, if you listen very, very carefully, you might occasionally hear someone snoring in the background. (laughs) I try to cut it out, but sometimes I can't. It will probably be Coco who likes to have a nap, now a little siesta, while I'm recording the podcast. He likes to be in the room with me. I think he likes listening, but sometimes he finds it a little bit boring and he falls asleep and he snores in the background. So if you hear somebody snoring, that's Rongar, that's Coco. So he actually inadvertently... That means without planning, he he does appear in podcasts. Could we do someday, Craig, maybe The Life of Coco or something like that? Yeah, we could do uh, an episode around Coco from his perspective, perhaps a day in the life of Coco. That would be interesting. We have spoken about vets, veterinary vocabulary and expressions with pets. Marcella, you may be interested in listening to that episode. That was episode 97. So go to inglespodcast.com slash 97 and you'll get some vocabulary connected to pets. One or two small things about your message. You used a, a phrasal verb that is very common with native speakers when people or animals that they're close to die because die is a word that people don't like to use very often, die and dead. So we like to use the phrasal verb pass away which is what you use, Marcella. But be careful of the pronunciation. It's a regular verb, pass, and the pronunciation of the ed is t, so passed away. And also another verb that you need to focus on is grow, and you use the phrasal verb to grow up. But unlike pass, grow is an irregular verb. So the forms are grow, grew, G-R-E-W, in the past, and the past participle is grown, with an N, 
G-R-O-W-N. So it's better to say, I grew up with pets because it's in the past. I grew up with pets or I have always grown up with pets in the house. Marcella, we really liked your use of adjectives to describe Harry. You described him as loving, cute, reliable, loyal. We're talking about Harry the Yorkshire Terrier. I think you said a Yorkshire, by the way. You said a Yorkshire. But you have to say a Yorkshire Terrier in English is the full version. I think that happens with a few other dogs, actually. I've heard people in Spain say, un golden, or my dog is a golden. Gold, a golden what? A, a golden, golden one. Yeah, you have to say in English, a golden retriever. retriever. And it's the same with a Yorkshire Terrier. Yeah, there are many types of Terriers. Yorkshire Terriers, um, Staffordshire Terriers, um, Fox Terriers. But you've got to say the word Terrier after Yorkshire. And I did like the expression, he will always be in my heart, which is a lovely expression to remember someone or a pet that you were very close to and you had a lot of affection for. So my first dog was called Timmy and he will always be in my heart. Yes, and let's not forget before Coco, the one and only Berta. The queen of all greyhounds, la reina de todas las galgas. If you listen, Marcella and listeners, to some earlier episodes when Berta was still alive, may she rest in peace. I often refer to her. She was she was simply the boss. She was the boss. I never ever saw ever any dog of any size or breed not doing exactly what she wanted. She was the boss. In fact, if you want to see a picture of Berta with Reza, go and listen to episode 97. And the image of that episode is Berta with Reza. So are you all set to speak about set, Reza? Are you ready? Are you set? I'm all set. Good. Well, let's just tell you why we're dedicating a whole episode to one word, set. A three-letter word? Three letters, one syllable, a whole episode. Is it worth it? Yes, it is. And even in this episode, we won't go much further than scratching the surface. That means just talking a little bit about what we could talk about, because the word set is the word with most meanings in the English language. Therefore, it has the longest dictionary entry in the Oxford English Dictionary, and in fact, in all in all dictionaries, if they're good dictionaries, if not, there's something wrong with your dictionary, it should be the one with the longest entry. So, for example, the 1989 edition of the Oxford English Dictionary uses no fewer than 60,000 words just to talk about the word set. We're talking about several pages. So it's a word that's used in many different ways and many different forms and collocations. So let's begin with a noun. You can have a set of something, which is a group or a collection of similar things. Now, I collect mugs. When I travel, I like to buy a mug, but I wouldn't call my collection of mugs a set because every mug is different. You could have a set of encyclopedias or a set of dictionaries, for example, or a set of cups and saucers. And I think the Spanish word, if you speak Spanish, is un juego. You know what, Craig? I've also heard Spanish people say un set. Oh, really? I've heard it said in Spain. I wonder if in Ecuador, Honduras and Argentina, where we had our feedback from and other countries, have you heard un set? I've heard it said in Spanish. You've taken the word for set from English to mean un juego. I've heard it sometimes. That's interesting. And it reminds me when I think of juego of a game like chess, because of course you can have a chess set as well. Now, Craig, whenever you hear in tennis, you hear at the end... Speaking of juegos. Speaking of juegos, exactly, games. You hear the expression game, set and match. What's this use of the word set here? Game, set and match. When you play a game of tennis, then it goes 15, 30, 40 points, and then you win the game. And the next stage, if you win enough games, then you win the set, which is the collection of games. So you win more games in a set than another person. And then if you win enough sets, 
you win the match. So set is very common in tennis. It's a noun. And you might hear on the news in English, oh, Rafa Nadal wins the first set. 6-4, for example. A film set that's using the word set as a noun is an important place in the film industry. And you can also be on set. To be on set, to be on the film set, means you're in the place where they're making, physically making the film, where they've got all the material ready and the actors are there and they've got all the costumes, etc. For example, in Hollywood, there are sets which are used to make many, many films. There are many sets in Hollywood. But just to confuse you, there's another use of set, which we could give an example in a sentence. Imagine a film called uh, Marie Mon, Mon Amour. Yeah. <laughs> Difficult to imagine, no? That film might well be set in Paris. The film is set in Paris. Now, that we're not talking about the film set. We're not talking about those studios in Hollywood where they physically make the film. It's another meaning of set, also typical to talk about films. And it means that it's the action takes place in Paris. The story is oriented in and around Paris. Most of the action in the story is in Paris. Maybe the film is actually made in Hollywood. Who knows? But in theory, the story is happening in Paris. The film is set in Paris. For example, the film Casablanca is set in Casablanca. But it was probably made in Hollywood somewhere. Yeah. By the way, the two different words, there are two different types of words. A film set... It's obviously a noun because I said a set, right? And the film is set in Paris or the series is set in Belfast. That's the verb to set, which is nearly always used in the passive form. The film is set. Another use of set, which I don't think is used very often these days as a noun, is a TV set or a radio set. That's an expression that my parents might have used, but I don't think it's very common these days. Do you? A TV set? TV or radio set, not except from the mouths of older people. Yeah. yeah. Now, one which is quite commonly used in the United Kingdom, but probably not many other places, is a set of badgers. And I say that because badgers are fairly common in Britain, but they're not very common in other places. It's an animal. Uh, that animal which has a black and white face. Un tejón. Un tejón, that's it. And the place where they live is called a set. There are a few other animals, I think, which live in sets, but I can't quite remember now. But certainly the one that comes to mind first is a set of badgers. So the set is like, it's the place where they live and it's also the community of badgers that live there. They are the set. I mentioned earlier a chess set, the game chess, but you can also have a set of playing cards, cartas, las cartas, a set of cards, or you could say a deck of cards, but both of those words are common when you speak about cards. Craig, if I said to you, the jelly I was making has now set. What do I mean? Well, you have to be careful because jelly in American English is mermelada, jam in the UK. But when you say jelly to me, I think of the British jelly, which is gelatina. So when you make jelly, you pour the hot water on the jelly and then you put it in the fridge and it becomes almost solid. And when it's solid, it is set. It's not moving. In a similar way, you can plaster a wall or if you break your arm or your leg, the doctor will put your arm in plaster and you have to wait until the plaster dries and goes hard and then you say the plaster has set. So you set your arm or you set your leg in a plaster cast. So I see a connection there between the plaster cast and the jelly, the idea of it's stopping moving. It's no yep. longer moving. Gets hard. It's become hard, right. If I say the sun sets, I don't mean the sun's becoming hard though, do I? No. What do I mean by that verb set? The, the sun's going down. So there's set as a verb to set. What time does the sun set? Well, at the moment in April, the sun is setting about half past eight, 8.45, the sun sets. And what day of the year is the day when the sun sets latest? 
That will be the solstice. Is it the 21st of July or June? It is here in Spain, although for Marcella, it will be the 21st of December, of course. Of course, in Argentina. The southern hemisphere, yeah. Yep. Okay, to set a date is a very important expression. Again, it's a verb, but yet another different meaning of the verb. It basically means to fix or establish something. So if you set a date, you talk about what would be a good time, then you decide, okay, it's set. A bit like what Craig was saying earlier about we can't, we won't change it now. It's not going to move. It's set. We set the date. You can also set homework to give homework, which the students have to do. You can set a price, fix a price, set an example, establish an example for other people to follow. You can set an agenda, which means give a kind of model of what you would like to happen and in the order and what has to be done. Set an agenda. In a meeting, for example, but that's not agenda in the meaning of diary, is it? That's more like um, orden del dia, what's going to happen during the meeting. Do you think you set a good example for your students? In some ways, yeah, I like to think so. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you do. I think you do. You can also set something in motion. So there's set used again as a verb. You can also substitute set for put. So you set something in motion or you put something in motion, something that starts happening to take the first step in a series of steps. For example, the detectives set the investigation in motion. They started investigating a suspect. So far, we've had uh, several uses of the verb set, and there are many more. Now we're going to be a bit more specific, and we're going to talk about phrasal verbs with set, of which there are many. Just to remind you, a phrasal verb is, you have a verb, plus a preposition, and they must go together, because they have a specific meaning, like take off, put on, go away. And the word set gives us many phrasal verbs, we're going to tell you some of the most important ones. For example, to set off. For example, you can set off in the morning. What time did you set off this morning? I set off. In other words, I started my journey. I left my house at about, about five past ten. And you arrived at eleven. That's a long time. Yeah. The bus took a long time. I had to wait a long while for it, and it took a long time because it's raining. And in Valencia, when it rains, traffic always takes 10 or 15 minutes longer. Similar to set off is to set out, O-U-T, out, to set out on a journey, for example. Now, Reza came here, which was quite a short trip on the bus, so he set off at 10 past 10. If you set out on a journey, it's more like a trip or a holiday or somewhere a bit further. So I set out on my holiday at six o'clock in the morning, for example. Or, or something really, really big, even like a voyage. For example, Christopher Columbus set out looking for India, but in fact he found America, but he set out looking for India. I said before that I set my glass down on the table at the beginning of the podcast. You can set or put something down somewhere. So if your friend is carrying a heavy box, you can say set the box down over there or set the bottle down on the table. So it's very similar to put down, to set down. The next one we've got is to be set on something or on doing something. I say doing, I-N-G, because remember, if you put a verb after a preposition in English, it's always going to be I-N-G. For example, I'm set on taking the exam. I'm set on taking the exam. That means I'm strongly in favor of it. I've made my decision and that's what I plan to do. What would be the opposite of set on doing something, Craig? Set against doing something. So against would be in Spanish, maybe contra. So it's the opposite. You're set against taking the exam. You don't want to do it. I'm set against traveling this year. I think it's a bit too risky at the moment, but I'm definitely set on traveling somewhere next year. Is there anything that you're set against doing? No, I'm quite, I'm quite open-minded. I'm not particularly set against anything. I am set on traveling 
whenever the pandemic restrictions end. I really want to travel. I've decided I really have to travel more once it's okay to do so. So I'm set on traveling as soon as the restrictions end, but not before. Yeah, me too. I agree 100%. Another phrasal verb with set is to set about doing something. And that means to begin doing something, to start doing something. For example, Reza woke up in the morning, he had a nice breakfast, and then he set about cleaning his flat. Yeah, it, it's things which are going to take a while, right? Yeah. So if you're set about doing something, it's not something you can do like in a two or three seconds. It's going to take you some time, isn't it? Yeah. I set about marking my students' homework. That's going to take a while. Another phrasal verb is to set up something. For example, a business. You can set up a business, which means to start or to begin or to launch, which in Spanish is lanzar. For example, we set up La Mansión del Inglés in 2001. Is there anything else you can set up apart from a business? Yes, you can set up equipment or any other word which is something to do with equipment. For example, when I come here to record the podcast with Craig, he sets up the microphones and he sets up the mixing desk for the audio. So he sets up the equipment. The thing with phrasal verbs that sometimes confuses students is that you can have more than one meaning to the same phrasal verb. And set up is a good example because, as we've just said, to set up a business or to set up some equipment is one meaning, but you can also set up a person. Now, that could mean to frame someone, which means to make it seem or appear that a person has committed a crime when really they're innocent. So if you put a gun in someone's flat, for example, that was used in a murder, you're setting up the person or framing the person for the crime. Is there another meaning? There is another meaning specifically of to set up a person. And it's very different. It means to put someone in a good position. So exactly the same words but a different meaning for example when i was younger i didn't have many opportunities but my uncle set me up with a good job in his company he set me up he put me in a good position he got me a job he arranged things for me he set me up so that's a completely different meaning of set up a person and another phrasal verb with two slightly different meanings, one literal and one idiomatic, is to set aside something. To set aside, A-S-I-D-E. So that could be physically to move an object to a different place. So I need to set aside this microphone stand to put something on the desk, for example. That's physically moving it. Or idiomatically you can set something aside for a later date. So those are some meanings of verbs, nouns, adjectives, phrasal verbs with set. But let's talk now about some specific fixed expressions with the word set. Craig, if I were to talk to you about a set piece, what do I mean? That reminds me of sports. For example, a set piece in football would be a free kick or a corner where you've rehearsed it, you've practiced it, you know where the players are going to go. Also in American football, you have set pieces which are called plays in the US. So they are calculated and worked out and planned before the game because you know you, you'll have a chance to do it during the game. Craig, would you like to be a member of the Jet Set? I would if I could fly anywhere. The Jet, the jet Set are glamorous, rich people who can fly off to Paris, to the south of France, or wherever they like, and have a holiday in the finest hotels and eat the best food available because they're very rich and they have the money and freedom to do what they want. So they are part of the Jet Set. However, there has been a major setback for the jet set. The setback has been the coronavirus pandemic restrictions as regards travel. It's a problem. It's, uh, it's something which is going to delay your plans or make you have to wait. A setback. 
You can set your mind to something. That's a common collocation. That means to make up your mind to be resolute and very determined to do something. For example, at the beginning of the year, I set my mind to going on a diet and doing more exercise and losing weight. And it hasn't been very successful. <laughs> What's the difference between setting your mind to something and setting your heart on something? They're similar, but they're not exactly the they're same. Not, are they? Mm, but very I've similar. I've set my heart on buying a new car, for example. Or you could set your heart on marrying the love of your life. It's more emotional, isn't it? More emotional. Yeah, you love this this person. You really want to marry them. You've set your heart on marrying this person that you love. It's very emotional. Whereas you set your mind to doing something in an efficient way and ach achieving an objective. Yes, it's more, it's a bit colder, it's more calculated. And be careful of the difference in the preposition. So set your mind to something or to doing something and set your heart on doing something. Well, now the next one is interesting. If you live in Valencia, as we do, it's pretty much impossible not to see somebody set something on fire in Valencia. Or you could also say, set fire to something. Let me give you an example. The Fallera Mayor set the Falla on fire. Or the Fallera Mayor set fire to the Falla. Two ways of saying it. So in other words, to start burning something, to set something on fire, or to set fire to something. For those of you who don't know, the Fallas are the festival in Valencia, where there's lots of fireworks and they set fire to huge effigies that they call fires in the middle of the street they set fire to everything don't they and if you are living as we do fairly near the sea you may see people setting sail now sail if you're a spanish speaker is a vela so to set sail means to start a journey in a boat so we're setting sail from the port of valencia at eight o'clock in the morning for example we're beginning our journey in our boat Now, you've probably learnt, or many of you have learnt, the expression to lay the table. And that's a good expression. But there is another way of saying it. You can also say to set the table. It's exactly the same. In Spanish, poner la mesa. So when you, you set, you lay the table, you put all the things which you're going to need, like the knives, the forks, the plates, etc. If you've been somewhere in your life, you can also say that you have set foot there. For example, I've never set foot in Reza's flat, which is not true. I have been to Reza's flat or I've never set foot in the town hall in Valencia. For example, I've never been there. I've never been inside. It's very often negative, that one, isn't it? Set foot like, imagine I don't want you coming into my garden because I don't like you. You're a neighbor I don't like. Don't I'll set with foot, yeah. yeah. Don't you dare set foot in my garden, I say. If you set foot in my garden, I'll call the police. Yeah. So it's very often negative. That's true. You can also set a trap for someone or something. Trap is trampa, so T-R-A-P, to set a trap for a person or an animal. To set the scene is a nice expression. The spelling of the word scene is S-C-E-N-E. -E. If you set the scene, that means you describe the basic details, the time, the place, where something's happening, so that whenever the story begins, we, we got an idea of what to expect. You set the scene in advance. So I'm going to tell you a story about Mary and John But first, let me set the scene. They met each other at school and they fell in love and they've known each other for quite a few years. So I've, I've given you the basic information before I'm going to tell you the rest of your, the story. I've set the scene. And another similar expression also taken from the theatre is to set the stage for something or for someone, which is to prepare something, to get it ready. Stage in Spanish is escenario. So you set the stage for a big event, for example. The stage has been set. Everything's ready and everything is prepared. Although it's often used metaphorically, mm -hmm. isn't it? Apart from concerts and performances. For example, the invasion of Poland set the stage for the Second World War. 
after that there was definitely going to be trouble because the British said to the Germans if you evade Poland we're going to help the Poles and they did so that set the stage that means it prepared what was going to happen next it can be used metaphorically Something that is not set in stone is this podcast, because if something's set in stone, it's fixed. Do you remember before we spoke about things like jelly and plaster becoming hard and fixed so it doesn't move? Well, in a similar way, if something is set in stone, it cannot be changed, it cannot be altered, it's predetermined. And with this podcast, we like to write down some ideas and then just talk about these ideas or vocabulary. So nothing really in this podcast is set in stone. It's variable. Sometimes people are very hard to change as well, but we don't say set in stone for a person. If it's a person who has very fixed habits that they don't want to change, you would say that that person is set in his or her ways. Craig, are you set in your ways? I'm getting more set in my ways as I get older. I like to have my coffee at a particular time. I have a particular breakfast. I have my daily habits. So the older I get, the more I'm becoming set in my ways. What about you? Yes, I guess it's inevitable, isn't it? Most people, when they get older, they get set in their ways because it's hard to break old habits. Another common collocation is to set a precedent for something. That's P-R-E-C-E-D-E-N-T, precedent. To set a precedent. For example, the iPhone set a precedent for its competitors. When the iPhone was released, it was very original, very groundbreaking technology. And mobile phones after the iPhone really copied a lot of the technology. So it set a standard or a way that other companies followed the design. It set a precedent. To set the pace is another common expression. It means to determine what the speed or the rhythm if something is going to be. For example, in a long distance cycle race, very often at the beginning, a group of good cyclists will go fast and they set the pace. So if they're gonna go fast, everybody has to go fast if they want to stand the chance of winning, they might go slow. Who knows? So whether they go slow or fast, they're setting the pace for the kind of general pattern of the race. If something is in prison or in a closed, restricted space, you can set it free. You can set a person free if it's a prisoner in jail, or you can set something free. The famous song by Joe Cocker, Unchain my heart, set it free. Craig, in the morning, do you get up because you have set an alarm? Is that how you get up? Not usually, but on Saturday mornings, I teach at nine o'clock. So I set my alarm for quarter past seven. What about you? Do you set an alarm or do you wake up with the sun? (laughs) If I have to get up at a particular time, I need to set an alarm the night before. In other words, I get the alarm ready to make a sound the next day. So you set mm, technical, mechanical things. You set an alarm, set a thermostat, set a timer, temperithador, that type of thing. Another thing that can be set is an example. As we said earlier, Reza sets a very good example for his students. What about to set someone straight? For example, Craig, I've been saying for years to the listeners that you're a huge fan of Mickey Mouse. Is that true? No, it's not. Let me set you straight on that. I'm not a particular fan. I've got nothing against. I'm not set against Mickey Mouse. But to set you straight, it's not one of my favorite cartoon characters. I have other cartoon characters that I prefer. I've set the record straight. He set the record straight. He set you all straight. He's corrected the incorrect information which I've been giving out. And it's often used in a way of a form of irritation or annoyance, isn't it? You'd say to someone, look, let me set you straight on something. It's usually said in a a quite an abrasive, annoying way. Well, that's all we have for you this week. We hope the uses of set have helped. And now it's your turn to practice your English. We would love to hear from you. Reza, how can people get in touch with us? 
Well, our favourite way is to hear you speak. So why not send us a voice message? You can record it at speakpipe.com slash podcast. But Craig, what if people want to write to us instead? You can write. You can send emails to me, Craig, C-R-A-I-G, at inglespodcast.com or to Reza at Belfast Reza, that's R-E-Z-A, at gmail.com. But we do prefer to hear your voices. And if you set your mind to it, you can record a message in English. If you're set on improving your English as much as possible, we advise you to have a look at the online store where you can find all sorts of useful material. Have a look at store, S-T-O-R-E, dot mansioningles.net. And we'd like to thank all of you who are helping us by supporting the podcast on Patreon. If you would like to join our lovely supporters, you can do that for as little as $1.20 per month. That's including VAT, the value-added tax, although that $1.20 is not set in stone. You can donate more if you'd like to, and you also get instant access to recent transcriptions. To do that, go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash English podcast. We'd like to mention everyone who's supporting us on Patreon. Unfortunately, we don't have time to say all of your names, but we will mention people who have joined us this month. Who are they, Reza? We've got Julio Flore Camino, Luis Andres Sainz Robles, Soledad, Nuria Montilla, Roberto Serrano, and Carolina Rateiro, who very generously has paid more than the minimum $1.20. Thank you very much to all of you. Yes, thank you for setting such a fine example. What's next week? Next week, we're talking about drinking idioms and expressions. Yes, we'll be putting and setting some alcohol on the table next week. Thank you very much for listening to us this week. We hope you have a wonderful week. Stay safe. Until next time, it's goodbye from me. And it's bye-bye from me. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later.